Hello and welcome to everybody who's here to join us today. My name is Matthew Patterson. I am the Director of Education at Mocha Jacksonville, and I would like to thank you for joining our program today. As a cultural resource of the University of North Florida, all of our programming at the museum is in support of our mission, which is the discovery, knowledge, and advancement of the art, artists, and ideas of our time. Uh, part of how we achieve that is by offering programs such as this one, which allow our audience to engage directly with artists and academics working on the edge of contemporary thought. If you enjoy this event, we hope that you will consider becoming a member of Mocha Jacksonville. Members are our biggest supporters and allow us to host free events such as this. Members also get free admission to the museum year round, special rates on other programs and classes, invitations to exclusive events, free downtown parking and more. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website and click on the support tab, or you can send an email to mocha membership at unf.edu. Of course, if you are a student or staff member of the university, you are entitled to many of these member benefits, including free admission to the museum during any of our open hours. Uh, so we will have time for questions and answers at the conclusion of today's program. If anyone in our audience has a question throughout the discussion, please feel free to enter it into the Q&A tab. Uh, at the top of the screen, and I will help to uh, facilitate those questions towards the conclusion. Uh, but at this point, we're going to kick off, and I would like to begin our program in, by introducing Neek McLeod, who currently serves as the president of UNF's Black Student Union, and who will be moderating today's conversation with our Project Atrium artist, Carl Joe Williams. So I'll hand it over to you, Neek. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, is it afternoon now? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Matt said, my name is Neek McLeod, and I serve as a Black Student Union president here at UNF. Uh, and today, I will be having an amazing conversation. We're just going to speak that into the atmosphere. I'll be having an amazing conversation with Mr. Carl Joe Williams that I really look forward to. So for the sake of everyone's time today, because we are so grateful that you all took some time out of your day to come hear our conversation, uh, we will jump right into it. Is that all right with you, Carl? Yeah. Of course. Right, perfect. perfect. So um, after doing a little research, I do see here that um, you had a New Orleans upbringing. Now, I've been to New Orleans a couple of times and the culture there, the, well, let me correct that, the Black culture there um, and just the overall like being that is New Orleans is so rich with vibrance and color and just everything that you would want on a vacation or anything. Honestly, if I could live there, I would. So I just wanted to know, how do you feel that your upbringing in Nola with all of those awesome qualities um, influence your art style? Um, I think it's just kind of feast of the senses to a degree. Um, we get inundated with so many different things that that feed our senses um, in, in terms of all the festivals, the musical uh, traditions, um, the food traditions, and all of these things just kind of come together to make an artist like myself always want to explore outside of the realm of visual work. Uh, I'm always interested in exploring other uh, elements besides just visual to incorporate into my work. So I think uh, that's an important part. I, I wound up spending quite a few years in Atlanta, Georgia, which, you know, shout out to Atlanta. Um, and I went there for college. However, even though I was doing work that was reflective of that uh, community uh, and the black community in Atlanta, um, there was also always um, me kind of borrowing from the culture that I'm from. And now that I'm back in the area and I've been here for 10, 10 plus years now, um, I think my work is actually developing even more because of the kind of environment that I'm in. Wow. Wow, that is beautiful. Um, and Atlanta is definitely a place that I have frequented and visited. And I have to agree that uh, it, while it has a different feel and obviously like the culture there is different, it is still very black and it is still yeah. like the art scene there is amazing from like the different murals and um, galas that they have there. I mean, even um, a few museums that I've been to there are amazing and it's rich with culture and 
everything that you would ever want to encounter. So thank you so much for that. Um, and speaking, since we're on the topic of upbringing and what helped influence um, your art style, um, when did you realize that you were talented at art? Like, was it just like one, one uh, you had some Crayolas one day and was like, wow, I'm really good at this. Or was it like a transformational like life event that was like, I'm about to take what I have or what I've been through and I'm going to put it onto this, this canvas or this piece of paper and it came out amazing. Ironically, there was always this, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that um, I kind of always knew. It was kind of always been there. And one of my earliest memories was me laying on the floor in diapers in my grandmother's house in the Calio project, drawing on this piece of canvas that my uh, uncle brought to me um, because he recognized even, I was like two or three, and he even recognized even back then that I was, I like to draw. So that was one of my earliest memories of, of um, like just being on the floor for hours and hours and filling up this canvas with like fire trucks and houses and cars and people. And then I, I want to say a couple of years later, after I like went to kindergarten, my mom used to work at this place called Mesa's Las Vegas Strip. Um, it was on Claiborne Avenue and my mom used to work there and I used to go there and just stay, I, you know, that was a place where I would just stay because they would let me, you know, stay there and while she worked. And there was this dude named Jesse, and Jesse used to do a bunch of like car cartoon characters and caricatures. And that's when it really clicked, like, I want to do that. And um, so what I did was he, he would do it to kind of entertain me, and I would take his drawing and I would do it exactly like, you know, as best I could, try to mimic what he did. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, everybody in the, in the little coffee shop, it was a coffee shop. And everybody in the coffee shop was like, oh my God, he did this. Oh, he's so talented. Oh, you need to keep it up. You need to, you know. Mm -hmm. So luckily I, I knew from an early age that this is something that I should do. Uh, and I've been doing it, uh, but it was around that time when I could actually admit to myself, although I used to tell people I wanted to be a doctor when they told me, because I just I used to like their um, I used to like the reaction that people gave me when you said doctor, oh doctor, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but really I I always knew that I was I needed to do this, um, so it was a, I was lucky in that sense that it started at a very early age, and I've been doing this for as long as I can remember. Okay. And while you say that you've been doing this and you just need that you had to do it, I want to say that you do it very well. Um, I had a chance to take a look at um, a few pieces of your installation um, on the Mocha website and I was just like, what? Like it looks almost 3D. It looks like very almost like you can reach out and the 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 characters in these paintings can almost reach out and touch you back. Um, it looks very vibrant. Um, it's very pleasing to the eye, and I was completely blown away. And I just love how so much of like the essence of blackness, not just like different random scenes, but literally scenes that we would see and identify with. Um, like just a couple sitting down at a table, a mother like nursing her child, like it's things that we will on, on, that we would see and only we would know and relate to. And that's why I love it. Um, so yes, you're doing it and you do it very well. And now that we're on the topic of your installation at MOCA, um, I wanted to know what was your inspiration behind the pieces that are currently at the installation at MOCA? Um, well, um, it, it took a while for it to get to the point where it is. Um, you know, thinking about the space, the space is immense. It's, it's a huge space. And I knew it had to be organized in such a way. So I just kept thinking about what made sense, um, what made sense conceptually. Um, and so I was, I was having a conversation and this, this term came up called decolonizing the mind. And my work is already um, connected to a lot of social justice issues and, and a lot of social, social justice ideas. And I was thinking about decolonizing the mind and 
what does that mean in terms of uh, how do we, how we see ourselves, how uh, we live in this this kind of social construct of of race, and it 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 destroys people. It destroys people. It takes lives. And I was thinking about all of these things while I was trying to conceptualize uh, this work of art. And the idea came to me to create a conversation um, and create a conversation that was kind of based in this idea of decolonizing the mind. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. However, I'm very interested in human nature and how the mind works and how humanity has gotten to the place that it is and how people in this country have gotten to the place that we're in. So that was, I guess, one of the core ideas that I kind of wrestled with. Um, how, how does one do this? And I know just in terms of dealing with the space, I knew that what kinds of things at the very bottom floor those things had to be way more engaging than what was on the second level and above. So I had to just kind of work that out in my mind and, and I kept thinking about it. Now, I was already interested in, in doing video and this is, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, um, I'm interested in things that touch our senses and video components is something I have been working with Anyway, so I thought maybe um, we could actually create a conversation and, and utilize video and uh, be able to have a conversation within the space that talked about some of the uh, some of the things that's been happening in our country and in our world. So that was kind of the core of the idea, and then it started to expand from there. Okay. Yeah. And it came together beautifully. Um, I love like your thought process and how you try to incorporate different uh, different topics like social justice and things that are actually important in that matter. And you incorporate that into your art um, to not only show um, a visual, a visually pleasing aspect of it, but to also try to engage the viewers in different topics. And I think that's a beautiful part of art. And I feel like that's something that you definitely relay very well. Um, and while we, uh, you mentioned social justice, so we know that with all of the uprisings and all of the, everything that happened over the summer up until today, um, all the things that this country has faced and even down to us as black people have faced, um, we, we feel it, we see it, and we literally have to encounter it every day. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as using art like you do to help to relay the messages and to help to um, incorporate how you feel about these different matters um, as it relates to social justice, um, what would you say, um, why, well, I will ask, why do you feel it's important as Black people to express ourselves through our art? Um, well, I mean, when you look at our history, particularly here, here in this country, um, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't express ourselves for a really, really long time. And we still see the legacy of that, that, that still permeates our culture. So for me, um, yeah, it's important to, to make work that in a sense pushes humanity in the, the best possible direction. And that, includes us actually looking at ourselves and looking at our history in a real honest way. And um, for me, um, personally as an artist and, and why I'm here on the planet, it, it feels like my work should be doing things that kind of pushes the, the needle forward as opposed to just creating something that's beautiful. Um, there has to be, for me, there has to be more content that actually kind of pulls the some of the layers away from the onion, so to speak, and try to help us kind of dismantle a, a, a destructive social construct that we live in and move to a better, higher level collectively. So um, for me, it's important that my work does that 
in, in some way, shape or form. Now, of course, everything I do is not necessarily uh, based specifically in that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm just trying to make connections between other human beings. Mm -hmm. However, in doing a piece like this, a piece that's so massive and in the time that we're living in, there was no other choice. Um, right. It was important to do this work in the way it was done. And it's, it's, it's a work of hope, actually. I mean, um, it's a work that, that actually has hope for the future, but it's confrontational in the sense that it's forcing us to deal with our past and it's forcing us to deal with our past that is actually affecting our present. And, um, you know, I, I had done a bunch of research. I, I have a, you know, I, I love to uh, work while I listen to books on, on audio, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's kind of one of the things. And um, one of the uh, books that really helped to shape the piece and some of the ideas in the piece was a book called Cast um, by Isabel Wilkinson. And uh, I, I love that book. Actually, I love her as a writer. I mean, she also did another book uh, called, um, God, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out on it. But she, um, that book was amazing and it really kind of informed the work and the kind of direction that I was going in. And it actually breaks uh, American history down into a caste system. Hmm. And it looks at it more as a caste system than, than a, a racial hierarchy. You know, it looks at it more as a human hierarchy. And so it's really, it was a really interesting uh, read and, um, it actually informed the work in a very real way. So um, it's important that that we as, a, as artists in general um, be making work that actually kind of moves the needle forward to a, to a better humanity, you know? So that's, that's um, you know, my job in a sense. So that's what <laughs> I see, you know? Okay. Now I have, since this is a conversation, I feel like it's only right that we get to know. I, I know a lot about you that I found online, but it's only right that we get to know each other, right? So um, I have to say, I'm not a visual artist by any means. I could probably draw you a little bird with lines or something maybe, but nothing too in depth when it comes to actually, you know, drawing or anything of that nature but I love to cook and I've been cooking since I was like eight I worked as a personal chef for a while mm -hmm. and I always get the question what is your favorite dish to make mm -hmm. and my answer is always I don't have one because you know with cooking that's my art so that's when I and a lot of people find cooking stressful but I find it to be very stress relieving um, because I can really get into it like you say I either put on like a podcast or maybe even like a, a Hulu show and literally just let it play in the background as I kind of zone out and I get into my art I use my different seasonings depending on what I'm making to help really encapsulate the flavor that I want for that dish right, right. so I know this is a hard question but I have to ask, is there like a one piece or I'll even, cause I know saying one piece is maybe harder than, than anything, but is there either one piece or one installation that you would say that you believe, you know how you have like those, those pieces or those pieces of art where you like, dang, I even blew myself away. Like I wasn't even expecting it to come out this good, but <laughs> it's good like this is probably some of the best that I've done and I wasn't even expecting it to be this good do you have any pieces or installations that you can like pinpoint and say you know what this one was one that I didn't expect to be this good but it came out amazing and it's probably one of my proudest works uh, <clears throat> well that one is one of uh one of them uh, the one in Jacksonville that we're talking about, that's that's definitely one of them. Okay. And it's partly because of the fact that uh, the space allows for so much that you can do with it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have I have a quite a few paintings that I, I think are pretty good. Um, it, you know, and there's some other pieces like, um, I have been doing some some works with old televisions and I would take the televisions and find video from old black TV shows and remix them and, and just, just really kind of uh, exploring. But um, 
I guess it's important for me to just feel good about the work that I do. So the majority of the work that I've done, I feel pretty good about. Okay. So, and I definitely think that the one um, in Jacksonville, the, the one that I, I, I worked on for maybe a year and a half, um, man, it had a lot of moving parts and it had a lot of things to figure out about it. And because it was so massive, I, I feel like it, it came out pretty good considering the fact that it was so many moving parts and so many things to think about. Um, but yeah, it, it worked out. And I, I like to cook too, but I, I just oh. been real busy. So <laughs> That's I feel like, like they say, you make time for what you, for what you love. So right, right. I, I tend to make time, but I do feel you sometimes it's, it's definitely uh, popping in the microwave and let it do what it do type of night. <laughs> yeah, but I, I used to, uh, I, I consider myself one of those people that, um, you know, I'm a, like a true creative, like everything that I'm, that's creative, I tend to be pretty good at. So I was actually, I'm actually a pretty good cook, you know? Okay. So I got that. <laughs> okay. Listen, one day I might have to hit you up like, hey, call, where's the jambalaya at? Okay. Cause I, I could feel it in my soul that you can make this um, awesome jambalaya. Yeah. I do jambalaya. I could do gumbo. I'm. A, I can make a good pot of gumbo. You know, and gumbo is not. You know. Listen. Um. You know what is a USPS? They ship, and I'm pretty sure if you pack package it up really nice. <laughs> yes, um, indeed. It will travel well. Um, that's that's all. I'm, I'm just leaving it out there. I'm just leaving it out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> on to my next question. It's actually a quote. Okay. That I found that was very interesting. And I wanted to get a little bit more insight into what exactly the background to this quote was. Okay. Um, so the quote is, I tend to think about my work like painting things that you can't see. I think about water, for instance. There's water mm -hmm. in the air. What is it doing? How does it function? And what would it, what would it look like if you could actually see it? Now, this brings me back to the comment that you made about like engaging the senses um, mm -hmm. with your art in all of the different ways. So that's what this quote made me think of. So could you go into a little bit more detail about what you meant by this quote or what, mm -hmm. you know, thought process went into this quote? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've said, I've said this before. Um, I feel like my, my spiritual life uh, kind of goes right along with 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 my work, and this it, they, they kind of mirror each other. So in that sense, um, I'm always thinking about things like that. Like when I'm working on images, um, I tend to think about those things that can't be seen that I can paint in, um, and be able to see. Uh, the, inv the invisible world or even the invisible world that I'm actually imagining because we only can see so much. So it's one of those things that, that fascinates me in terms of my creative process. So I use my imagination to imagine a lot of things that may or may not be there, but actually have it incorporated into my work as you know solid visual, objects or a solid visual uh, entity. So that's kind of where it comes from. It's, it comes from my imagination and it comes from the, the reality of our existence. And there's so many things that we are influenced by, but we can't see with our own two eyes. You know, Sometimes we can feel it, uh, but we can't necessarily see it. So when I am approaching a painting, um, I think like that. You know, I think about this, the invisible world that has all of these shapes and patterns that actually influence us, influence our lives, but we can't necessarily see it because we're so entrenched in it. We, we become so, so much a part of it. It's like the forest and the trees. So it's just, I, I would say it's just kind of a, a creative idea or a creative concept that I build off of using my imagination. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, and I like how you said how like there's so many other things in the world that we may not be able to see. Um, and so many different processes behind the scenes that we can't visually see, but we know that it's working because we see essentially the fruits of its labor, even though we can't physically see the process. Right. So 
it's right. our jobs to use our own imagination to kind of bring those processes to life that we can't actually see, but that our imagination helps us to build. Right, right. I mean, like we're on a Zoom meeting, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Right, okay. So yeah, I yeah. think you explained that beautifully. Um, and I love how it, like it's, it challenges, it, you have to, it challenges you to think. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, I, one thing I learned is that common sense is not so common and that someone's version of what sense may be common is not the same as someone else's. So mm -hmm. I, I love how we use um, our art to basically leave our pieces of history because essentially before we were born um, and before the history books that we know, we don't know how real that stuff is. We're right. just reading what we see or what was written, but mm -hmm. who knows what the world was like 200 years ago. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I love how you brought that to how you brought that to light. Because when I first read that quote, I was like, it made me think. <laughs> so that that must be the question of the hour: think, not even the question, the word of the hour: to think. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and use your imagination. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So let's see, um, I see, um, while doing my research, um, I do see here that you are very involved within your community and I came across um, something called Blights Out. Mm, right. So could you go into a little bit more detail about what your involvement is with Blights Out and what exactly it is? Okay, um, it was a few years back, um, I got a, a, um, a message from a friend of mine who was interested in doing something with blighted property. Initially, it was about painting on the properties. Um, there's a lot of blight in New Orleans since uh, Hurricane Katrina. Okay. And it was about going to- And I'm uh, sorry, I'm sorry, could you, go, could you tell us what blight is for those who may not know? Oh, blight is just basically abandoned houses and neighborhoods, okay. houses that are boarded up, uh, houses that uh, attract, um, quote unquote, crime and drugs. Um, so it's basically blighted property, uh, you know, unoccupied property, unkept property. Um, and so there was a lot of blight in New Orleans, particularly after Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine uh, had an organization that he asked me if I would be interested in being a part of. And uh, I, I wasn't interested in it in that way. Um, I was actually interested in doing things to help refurbish those properties and, and trying to create some kind of space for, for the community. Um, which it, it got to be really interesting because I like emailed somebody. There's a, a biennial that comes here every few years uh, called the uh, Prospect. Prospect uh, New Orleans, which is basically a huge art exhibition. And I emailed someone about my ideas about actually taking some property and doing something interesting with it. And next thing I know, there was a, it was a huge um, response from a bunch of different people. And I connected to an artist named uh, Lisa Siegel out of New York, who was actually a person who was a part of Prospect. And then she came down from New York to New Orleans to look at properties because she had an idea about something that she wanted to do with some properties. So actually it wound up being her, me, and another young lady named Amani Jacqueline Brown. And the three of us started to create programming around dealing with blight and dealing with property and trying to figure out uh, different ways and different strategies that we can use to actually help to improve these properties and improve the neighborhood. So uh, ultimately it wound up being a series of different projects that we did uh, in the neighborhoods to, uh, I guess, to not only just, just to bring more awareness to some of the problems of gentrification, because that was a whole nother component of, of what we were uh, dealing with, but also to give people an opportunity to really think through um, you know, problems like this that were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, my idea was to get more people to own properties in, in our communities because our communities was becoming very gentrified. So 
from that, we did a series of uh, community projects that, um, that involved a lot of different people. Um, and then I, I want to say a few years ago, it kind of went down and it, it, it slowed up a bit uh, activities, uh, partly because uh, Amani Jacqueline Brown, she moved away uh, and Lisa went back to New York. And so it's something that I still want to want to involve myself in in the future. So I feel like there's more to come in that particular project. Um, so it's a little quiet right now, but. <laughs> well, I feel like that's the same for um, a lot of organizations and um, things of that nature, especially those who actually go out into the community because of the current you know, pandemic that's mm -hmm. going on right now. It already gives us our limits, like you said, hence while we're on Zoom instead of like physically in person and, you know, really mm -hmm. having a in-person conversation. Um, there's a lot of factors, but just a simple fact that, you know, the this it sounds like it went from a thought to a physical thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a physical thing that was essentially in place to help build up the community because you sound very humble in your explanation but from what i saw what i have here it doesn't sound like something to be i feel like i you need to dig yourself up a little bit more because it sounds like an amazing initiative um and it's cited as a coalition of communities who have not ordinarily been in dialogue with mm -hmm. artists policy makers nationals and locals, as well as natives and newcomers, young and old, and people of all races, economic status, backgrounds, and professions. That yeah. alone is breathtaking. To have all those people in either one room or a virtual room, or even in the same place, like springboarding ideas off of each other, how to you know build up these communities. I feel like that's an amazing thing because a lot of times we have like these solitary groups. Like we may have a group of artists, or we have a group of policymakers who may meet to decide what's best for the community. But when we align all of these people in positions together, I feel like that's the best way to find out what's for the greater good because you're getting all of the aspects of the community you're getting the yeah. people who may be on the lower spectrum of lower spectrum of the income of the income bracket and some people who are on the higher and you have some mm -hmm. people who are in within the schools who see what the kids deal with every day and then you have the people who deal with the different policy make policy makers and um say judges and politicians and things of that nature so i feel like with that full scope of how people identify within the community. Um, it's an amazing initiative. And I really hope that you all are able to get the, get back on the ground running and continue it because it's an amazing, amazing um, initiative. And I, I, I feel like you should be a little less humble about it because it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I was It was one of those things where I knew that we could do way more than just paint um, fake windows and doors on boarded up houses and that's a, that was what the original idea was oh, okay. i wasn't yeah i wasn't interested in that <laughs> but luckily luckily um me just thinking about what could be done and reaching out to 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 others it, it kind of got the ball rolling and um attracted a lot of really uh beautiful powerful people to the initiative so it was it was awesome and i feel like you know it was one of those things where i just kind of followed my gut um to to not just say no but let's see if we could kind of shift um shift the the idea the the motive you know uh a little bit and and let's explore something that uh actually has a little bit more stake in our community um I mean, beautification, uh, beautification is fine. It, I mean, it has its place. Um, however, it wasn't necessarily for me. Um, I wanted to see more done with, with, with some work like that. And I feel like it's, it's uh, important for artists to be able to be involved in those kinds of processes. Um, yeah, it was, it was new for me, but you know, it was definitely eye-opening and I learned a lot from that the that whole uh organization and and some of the things that we worked on and did however there's still a lot more work to do still a lot more work so i appreciate it yeah. no problem and 
I feel like, like, like you said, it's a lot more work to do, and that's in every aspect. I feel like whenever we reach a point of accomplishment where we tackle one goal or we tackle one event or we tackle, you know, one initiative, it, we always feel like, okay, what's next? There's right. always work to be done. So long as we are here on this earth, we always have work to be done. But Absolutely. it's also important for us to recognize and congratulate ourselves, even if no one else is, for even the small wins that we have, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So um, I have two more questions for you. Um, the last one is, is, I feel like it's fun. So I'll keep that one for the end. But okay. I did want to ask, like, because I'm pretty sure we have a lot of um, young artists or, you know, young aspiring artists here in the event. Um, and even for any, you know, anyone of any, all, of any, any and all ages, races, backgrounds who may want to get into some art because we're all sitting at home. A lot of us work from home um, mm -hmm. or maybe stuck in the house for whatever reason. So a lot of people are turning to different activities and crafts um, in order to really keep their minds going and to, the, to honestly take up some time. Um, so for those who may be interested in getting into art, but may feel like may either be uninspired or um, discouraged, maybe they try art before and, you know, have a passion for it, but don't really like how, you know, the results are coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you say to those people um, who may be uninspired or discouraged um, as far as like mm -hmm. continuing on with their art journey? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, being discouraged, my God, encouraging yourself, is, it, it's a skill to a certain extent <laughs> because I find myself, um, there was times where I, I think I was uh, discouraged at times. Um, and, but the, the one thing I had was this kind of inner knowing that this is what I was supposed to do. And I did it despite everything. Um, and I would encourage someone who's in that position to move forward in whatever creative endeavor that they, they feel like they need to do. If, if it's inside of them to express themselves in these type of ways, would it be music, uh, painting, sculpture, or whatever? I think it's important to do that. Um, because that action leads to another action and to another action. And, and before you know it, you have a body of work. So I would say, get good at figuring out how to encourage yourself. <laughs> because um, I just feel like to a certain degree, you have to have a strong mind in this, in this type of thing. Um, because you, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. However, if you feel like in your heart that this is something that you're supposed to be doing, then you have to encourage yourself and realize that you're having those feelings for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, you're having those feelings for a reason. And you just never know um, what you create, how it's going to move and affect the, the, the world. You, you don't know. So I would encourage people who are in that state to continuously encourage themselves. Now, how you do that, um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but I do feel like if it's there, then you should do it. And a lot of times the act of creating and the act of doing something that's creative will kind of lift your spirits to a certain extent, because if you actually find yourself creating something that you feel is worthwhile, it's self-encouraging in a sense. Um, it makes you feel like, yeah, well, I can do this now, or I can explore this now. You know, it's almost like, you know, like there's a, might be a dish that you never cooked before, but yeah, no, it looks, <laughs> looks a little complicated. Right, but yep. you know, you, you try it and you do really, really well at it, and you're like, "Oh wow!" And I feel like next time I could tweak it like this, or, or, or what have you. So I would say personally, just act, do the thing, you know, do the thing, you know. You don't have any excuses. Right. Just do the thing. Don't think, don't think negatively about it. Um, because there's enough negativity in the world, 
if you already feel like it's something that you need to do, just do that. And, you know, and just be on the lookout for whatever kinds of messages that you get about it and just continue down that path. I know it's a, it's a little complicated, but I feel like first off, you just need to do the work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like with me, I could definitely say that, you know, my life has had quite a few ups and downs. Um, there was actually a period of time where I didn't work, didn't do work, art. And I know it's ironic considering the fact that I told you I've been doing this all my life. But, you know, there was a few patches of life where I just kind of got off track. And, you know, I had to really put myself in this mind state of, okay, I'm going to start here. And then, you know, it was one time, I, I think it was especially after Hurricane Katrina, I, had, I didn't do work for a while because of a bunch of different reasons. And I think it was like three years later, I started to do a little bit of work and just build and build and build. And, and now here we are, we're having these, these types of conversations. So you have, to, you have to start somewhere and it's all in the work that you're doing you have to start and hopefully the work itself will give you the encouragement and the vision to continue to move forward down a particular path you know so that's my advice to people who might be artists or wanting to do something like this or some other creative endeavor um do it first off do it and 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 find that uh, inspiration within yourself to continue to do it. Like with me, I, I, I could go back and look at the work from that time and think, oh, that work was horrible. It actually wasn't. Um, it was just me building on that. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely just do the work and continue down the path of, of creating and uh, self-encouraging because if you do the work, somehow I think the encouragement is going to happen. <laughs> You're going to be able to self-encourage yourself if you, especially if you like what you've done, you know, right. so. I definitely agree. I agree with you. Um, we keep, we keep, I don't know how we keep circling back to food, but um, even when it comes, <laughs> Even even when it comes down to like cooking and people will say like, oh, I don't know how to cook. Cooking is too hard. Cooking, I feel like people let their insecurities and they let their anxiety get to them before they can even do it and just do right. it. Um, so I feel like if you have something that you want to get into, especially if it's art based, that should be something that is like your you time like your time to lay all of the stresses of the world off and mm -hmm. you know fully immerse yourself in whatever art that it may be whether it be cooking or painting or drawing or whatever form the art may be um mm -hmm. just completely immersing yourself in that and giving your time away from the world and immersing your true self into whatever art that you're doing so yes right. i love that explanation it was very very beautiful um sure. For a lot of people, not to cut you off, no, no. for a lot of people, I was just thinking about my uncle. Um, it's a piece I'm working on behind me. And uh, he was he was very, um, he was an artist and he didn't do art to sell it. He did art for therapy, you know, it was therapeutic for him. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people out there, I do believe that that might be the case. Um, it can, put you in a much higher mind state sometimes to be able to, to have some kind of creative expression in your life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you might not necessarily be trying to build a career doing it, but I do, I do believe that not only, only are you going to benefit from it, but the people around you will ultimately benefit from it. Why? Because you're in a better place. Mm -hmm. So I would like, I, again, I would encourage anybody who has any kind of creative impulses to go at it full speed ahead with no fear, you know? Right. And I love <laughs> that last point that you made because like you said, like once you essentially complete whatever it is, the people around you will benefit from it because you're in a better place. Um, mm -hmm. That reminds me of something that my grandmother would always say, like if we would be out at a restaurant or even at someone's house and whoever made the food is in a bad mood, my grandma would be like, nope, not eating that. I don't like that energy. 
Like, cause whatever you, whatever you create, whatever art you create, whatever form it may be, people, that, in, that energy transfers to people. It's so you have so to be cool. in the right headspace in order for your art to really translate to the audience. It's so true. Like, yeah, if you eat eating food from somebody is who's in a negative headspace, it can affect you on us on a on a level that we can't see. Mm-hmm. Right? That we can't see. You have to use your what imagination. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Listen, but we it's might true. as well just do a little lecture series. I think we, we got this. <laughs> I think we got this. We, UNF, hello? Anybody listening? Yes, we, we could have our whole lecture series on thinking and using your imagination. Yes, um, indeed. Yes. <laughs> so this is my final question. And of course, it has to do with food. But it's a fun question. It's hopefully going to make you think. All right. Uh, so in one of the organizations that I'm in here in camp, on campus, it's called the Community Alliance for Student Success. Uh, Ms. Whitney Meyer, she always asks us this question, like if we could basically describe ourselves in any way, like essentially what style of cake would you be and why? But for you, and I already kind of feel like I know what you're gonna say, but for you, when it comes down to your art style, your overall art por- portfolio and your whole art style and your inspiration, all of that together, if you could name one food that can, encompass your whole portfolio what would it be see that's gonna be hard because i feel like i'm more like a buffet you okay. know i don't feel like i could be one food i feel like i'm a, I'm a buffet okay. of foods that all go very well together okay <laughs> i don't know how else to tell you i mean i can't say it's gonna be jambalaya i can't say it's gonna be you know, uh, uh, sandwiches and omelets or whatever. I just feel like it will be multiple portions of different things that all really work very well together. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's hard for me to narrow it down to one one culinary experience, okay. you know? Cause there's so many different, yeah. It's so many different things that I'm into mm-hmm. uh, creatively. Um, I mean, I used to write poetry. Wow. You know, like <laughs> I, I have, I have my, like, I have a, a history of working with rappers and singers. I make beats. I organize music. I what? Videos. I, I mean, that's, that's what I mean. It's, it's like a lot of times I'll bring all of these things together. My work has always been based in painting and, and, and visual art. But I've always had interests outside of that. That's why, you know, earlier I talked about the senses and and kind of um, working from that headspace of dealing with different parts of our senses and bringing those ideas into the work. And so it's really hard for me to narrow it down to one food. You know, I mean, I don't know, beans and rice, red beans and rice with with fried chicken and cornbread. Okay. <laughs> Look, that's a whole range right there. That's a whole plate. See, I personally thought that you were that you were gonna say gumbo. Considering the fact that gumbo has so many different components into it down to like what is it, the gumbo filet that you have to put in it to um to thicken it up. Uh that and then if you have like the shrimp and the okra and the tomatoes and the onions, or what is it, the um holy trinity. That, that's a whole no tomatoes. <laughs> No tomatoes. <laughs> Don't do the tomatoes. <laughs> okay. We can, okay, so no tomatoes, but <laughs> I thought tomatoes. Anything. But um, yeah, you have the okra, and you know, some people do like chicken and shrimp with you know so many different components. I feel like well, if I had to answer, gumbo would probably be mine, simply because. Um, if I go deeper into it, mainly because not only does it have a lot of like ingredients, but all of the spices that go into it too. I feel like for me, um, like you said, I do a lot of things in the realm of art. So mm-hmm. for me, I feel like the components of gumbo, especially if it's spicy, because mm-hmm. you got the savory, you got the spicy, you got the umami, and then you have like the different textures and flavors. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a big pot 
of so many different things. Right. And I feel like gumbo would be it for me because it's like one bowl of so many different things, so many different textures and flavors. Um, and I feel like my artistic style is complex in that way. Um, yeah. Whether, I, you know, I think see, you that's what I thought you were, that's what I thought you were gonna say. I thought you were gonna beat me to it, but you're a buffet. <laughs> so you have a lot more. Yeah, I believe you have a really good point with that. The one thing about gumbo, gumbo is really good for anybody who's never had it. And the fascinating thing about gumbo to me, especially once I left New Orleans, was it's so many different ways to make gumbo, mm -hmm. right? But you know it when it's not right. <laughs> I've heard that too. A million, it's just like a million ways. I mean, I've, I've heard of duck gumbo, chicken gumbo, seafood gumbo, pole man's gumbo, you know, gumbo with like just vegetables, which actually I've never had. I, I need to try that. But it's so many different ways to make it. But yet you always know when it's on point and then you know when it ain't. Like I remember being at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta years ago to, to a Falcons game. And they had this like Cajun cart or whatever. And they, they were selling food and they had gumbo. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God, it looked like pulled pork. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is this? This is oh, so man. But, you know, of course, I mean, they were giving samples and I had to try it. And it was just like, it was like more like beef and gravy. And it was just odd. It was so odd. But anyway. That sounds very the fascinating awesome. thing about gumbo is the fact that there's so many different ways to make it, mm -hmm. but you know when it ain't right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something I can agree to because when I went to New Orleans, it was we went to a different like a bunch of different spots and I will always just get like small things off the menu because I like to go to places and try different things. So mm -hmm. I can definitely agree that yes. some places are better than others, even when it comes down to well. Honestly, I feel like Cafe Du Monde is like the only place that you can go get beignets from or that you should get beignets from in New Orleans. Unless it's like some little mom and pop that you can put me on to. Right. Better. right, right. Yeah, there used to be another spot, uh, but it, it shut down. Actually, yeah, I, Cafe Du Monde is like the main place I go to now because the other spot has closed down. It used to be open like all night long. So you can go there at like four in the morning and get beignets. I used oh. to love them. But um, yeah, there's a place here in town called Lil Dizzy's, which is one of my favorite restaurants. If you ever hear go, um, I think they might be closed because of COVID, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure, but it's one of my favorite neighborhood spots. The food is freaking amazing. That's all I got to say. So this is okay. Yeah, I'm about to say we can probably shut this down because now all I can think of is um, what is it? The, the oysters Rockefeller from Agni Oyster House. Um, and now oh, it's time for lunch for me because <laughs> I'm just anytime I think of New Orleans, I just get hungry. But um, yes, that was all of the questions that I had for you today. Um, okay. I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, oh, and I believe we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, and at this time, anyone in the room, if you want to submit your questions in the Q&A feature, um, we can read those off before we hop out of here today. Yeah, so we've got uh, some comments and some questions here that I will uh, go through for for Nick and for Carl. Uh, first question uh, from Larry reads, who are the top three inspirational artists that have influenced you? Hmm. Good question. Um, I will have to say, well, my mentor, uh, a man named John Scott, who kind of took me under his wing when I was about 15 years old. I went to a uh, New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, which is an arts high school here in, in New Orleans. And uh, he came by and he saw my work and, and uh, asked the principal and my, my parents if I could come over for a couple of days a week. And, I, and, and uh, he was the first African-American artist that I ever spent time with and uh, sometimes it would just be me and him. He'd be working on a maquette for a sculpture and I'd be over in the corner doing an assignment that he gave me. And uh, I wind up leaving and going to, to, to Atlanta. 
Um, and then years passed by and then he passed away. But that time was so valuable to me, so valuable. And uh, he's, he's a, he was a great, great artist. He was over the, the uh, Xavier uh, Art Department. He was the head of the Xavier, uh, Xavier University Art Department, which is a, a historically black college. Okay, so he's number one. He also won the MacArthur Genius Award back in the 90s. So he was huge, huge influence on me. Uh, Carrie James Marshall. Um, Carrie James Marshall, um, his work blew me away. Um, I, I discovered his work uh, right when I was in that in-between stage of not doing work. Um, you know, I wasn't producing work. I was just kind of working a job, taking care of my, my kids, wife, and, and all of that and stuff. And uh, I, I was in between a whole lot of my life. And I was in the library and I ran across his book and it just blew my mind. Um, and Deester Gates, I would say for some of this, this his socially uh, engaged work, some of the works that, he, that he's done, um, more interested in his social practice work. Um, and it was some of the, some of his work actually inspired, uh, the Black South, uh, program that, that, uh, we started. So I, I could say those three were very, um, instrumental in me and the artists that I'm, you know, have become and, you know, evolving into. So, but yeah, John Scott, Kerry James Marshall, Deester Gates, this, there's a, there's a bunch of others, but uh, those are the ones that come to mind right away. Willie Birch. Uh, Willie Birch is a important role model for me. He's an artist that still lives here in New Orleans. Well, and he lived in New York for many, many years, but uh, he, he's another artist. Uh, Lynn Emery uh, is another artist who's a very you know, influential, uh, kind of a mentor to me. I consider myself as an artist that has a lot of mentors. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean I've, I've met them all. Um, but uh, John Scott, definitely. Uh, Willie Birch, um, D.S.T. Gates. Uh, I love what he's, he's been doing outside of the realm of making visual art, but actually doing things in, in his community. Um, it's another artist out in, in, in Houston, Texas. God, I can't, I'm having a brain freeze on that. Um, but yeah, those, those are the ones that are coming to mind off the top of my head. So yeah. That's great. Carl, we've got another question for you in here. It reads, uh, do you think that your confidence affects your work, not only in how you see it, but the quality itself? Mm. Yeah, I think confidence can affect everything. Um, but it's interesting because I'm, when it comes to my work, I'm extremely confident about it. And I've always been like that. I, I think it has to do with the fact that I've been doing it for a really long time. Um, I've had experiences as a growing up, uh, being in classes with other artists and being in art classes. I always noticed that my work would, would be the work that kind of stood out to people. And it happens all the time. It's, it's happened a lot. So that has actually, you know, led to my, me being confident about my work. So, but at the same time, confidence, um, you don't want to get complacent. Uh, you don't, you don't want to get lazy in the sense that you don't consistently push yourself into areas that you're not so familiar with. Um, and it's a, it's a real strong balancing act of making work that fits your visual language while at the same time pushing the boundaries of that work into a direction that you're not so comfortable with. 
and finding confidence in, in those spaces becomes a little challenging because if you're not familiar with the areas that you're pushing your work in, you're just not sure how, how it's gonna work. I remember I had a bad experience many years ago. Um, I was working in Atlanta and it was, um, it was about this time where I had a, a bunch of projects going on at, at one time. And I decided I didn't have a whole lot of time to do this work. And I decided to do something really, really different. And the gallery saw it and they were like, what the hell is this? And it was so different from what I normally do. And even in the uh, local critic had come in to do a kind of a preview of the show and just was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so I was like, and the, and the gallerist who, who, was, uh, who ran the gallery like literally canceled the show because they didn't like the work. And I go back and look at the work. I, I wind up doing images of work. And actually it was one of those low points in life where I was just like really embarrassed by it. And I go back and look at that work and think to myself, you know, it was a lesson in not ever taking such a radical turn um, in my work, um, but maybe experimenting a little bit and moving in a direction in a more calculated fashion. Um, yeah, it was one of those experiences that taught me a lot. I mean, it was embarrassing at the time, but now it's just it just kind of serves me as a, a lesson of how to do that, like how to move into areas that you're not so comfortable in and do well without completely throwing people off. You know, it's like speaking English and then starting to speak a language that nobody's familiar with, you know? So yeah, that's, uh, you know, confidence does make a difference, but you also have to um, kind of temper that with uh, being able to uh, not do too much to the point where people won't be able to understand what you're trying to do. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A function. There's some nice um, feedback there and comments. Um, just thanking you both for the conversation. Um, I do have a question though, Carl, could you talk a little bit uh, before we wrap up about the hashtag campaign that you're working on with uh, Mocha and how folks can uh, participate? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, initially when I was conceptualizing the work at the in the atrium, um, my thoughts was this is a conversation that should not be um, only contained in the gallery space. I felt like it should be something that's out in the world. And the only way I can think to do that was through some kind of hashtag campaign. So what I would like to do is open it up to the general public to be able to talk about the American dream in the sense of um, what does the American dream mean to you? Uh, how, how does your family's economic legacy affect your view of the American dream? Questions like that. And I would like people to actually contribute to the hashtag campaign um, through video by just literally, you know, getting on camera and stating uh, their answers and putting the, the uh, question in the title and using the hashtags to be a, a part of the conversation. And also for people who are not so um, comfortable with video, I've opened it up to spoken word artists and rappers and, and just really trying to kind of um, really kind of level the playing field and how many different ways that one can express these ideas. So I would love uh, everybody who's listening to contribute to this hashtag campaign if it's with video or if it's with, um, you know, getting on camera and answering the questions similar to the video that's in the exhibition, or uh, I have a spoken word artist doing spoken word. I um, have somebody else who's actually gonna write their uh, answers out and post it 
so I'm open to any way that one can actually contribute to the conversation because the work is about hope and this is about pushing humanity forward in a positive direction. And we have to confront uh, our history and we have to confront our present. So it's important that more people uh, be a part of this conversation. It's not a conversation that needs to be contained in the gallery space. So I would like and I invite everybody who's listening to, uh, to contribute to the hashtag campaign. And the hashtag is um, hashtag making, um, make, making the dream real, um, hashtag Mocha Jacks, hashtag Carl Joe Williams, and any other hashtags that you would like to contribute to this dialogue. So I would, I invite everybody to, to uh, get involved in that. It could be images, it could be written text, um, I'm inviting any kind of interpretation of these questions. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a great campaign to be a part of. Uh, we've already had some, some really excellent responses um, from the public as a part of that. Um, awesome. I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so unless there's Matt, anything Matt, else I to add. Another quick question. Yeah, Matt, please do. Question. Um, so we know about your installation at MOCA. Would you happen to have any other installations throughout maybe the country um, that people can go view if they just so happen to be traveling safely? Um, not at the moment. No, that one's, that one's pretty much it. Um, now I was just telling uh, Matthew, I've just finished a, a children's book that I've been working on for like two years. So like soon as I finished the, the piece, um, in the atrium, I came back to New Orleans and like started hustling to try to finish that. And okay. now it's all about trying to make new work and and uh, what else I got going on? Oh yeah, I got another children's book I've been working on. I'm wow. all about the kids. I love the youth. So yes. I prefer- <laughs> Children are our future. Yes. yes, indeed, absolutely. And that, and that's part of the reason why the work is the way it is because it's about trying to create a better future for our children's children's children, you know? Mm. And I think it's important for human beings to think like that. Um, and yeah, so I don't have any uh, installations up right now, um, but I am working on a bunch of other uh, projects and some of them are like, I'm having a brain freeze right now. I can't think of any of them. <laughs> well, it is, it is perfectly fine. I just wanted to make sure that you had the space and the platform to share any additional information on what you may be working on with the people um, so that we all know how to support you in the future. Yeah, it's probably going to come to me as soon as we get off, but <laughs> at the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Okay. Well, guys, I think the, that's probably a good note to end on. This has been a really terrific conversation. I want to thank Carl for joining us uh, for this and very big thank you to Neek for organizing and leading this conversation as part of uh, UNF's Black History Month celebration. Um, I do encourage everybody who's on the call today to um, visit the museum if you're able to and to see Carl's exhibition in person. It's going to be up with us um, until March 21st. We are open during the week, uh, Tuesday through Sunday, and we do have tours of the museum on Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m., which also visits the, the exhibition. Um, and all that information is available on our website at mochajacksonville.unf.edu. Um, again, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, unless there's any last comments, we will go ahead and, and wrap up there. I appreciate you all for having me. Thanks for all the questions. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, y'all. Uh, we will talk soon. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.